All right. Everybody today, we have Professor Darla Chase, who is a professor of clinical medicine and also in uh, biomedical informatics, and we will be talking about the Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Let me just, um, undergraduates, raise your hand. Do we have any? Excellent. Pre-meds? See nodding. Good. Graduate students. Faculty? Old people like me who are like taking a, another course for, you know, for no good reason. Um, today I get to talk about clinical decision support. Uh, you're, right now we're living in an explosion of computer algorithms that are supposed to help us, the doctors, practice better medicine. And um, to some extent, we are achieving that goal, but I will, as I'll discuss later, have some serious concerns about how we're doing and, and what we need to worry about. So let me um, just go through, hello. Do I advance here with enter? Yes. Okay, good. Oh, that guy there. Yeah, I'm the tech guy. I can't even work a computer. Um, so I just want to say I have no industry conflicts. And here are our learning objectives today. This is what we want to accomplish. By the end of this lecture, I'm hoping that you will be able to define clinical decision support. You'll be able to discuss why we need it. You'll be able to provide examples of successful tools. And then this part of the talk has grown over the last several years, uh, discuss the serious concerns that we have with our decision support tools right now. So what is decision support? Uh, it's a person working in partnership with an information resource that's better than the person unassisted. Now, this is a hard, tough pill for doctors to swallow. They can't believe that a machine is going to make them a better doctor. So I see a real generational divide. Your generation makes, you know, says, of course, the machine's got to be better, uh, you know, helping the doctor. But the older generation has been uh, fighting it for several years and they're not convinced. I call it augmented intelligence, not artificial, augmented intelligence. Um, the goal of decision support, this is an old uh, definition, it still applies, is to improve healthcare delivery by enhancing medical decisions with targeted knowledge, targeted knowledge, not irrelevant knowledge, we're gonna talk about that later on. Patient information, and other health information. Now that's obviously expanded. We have wearables. I must've walked 12 miles trying to find this building this afternoon, but I got credit. So, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Why do we need clinical decision support? And I wanna make it clear that I'm not um, being negative about our profession. It's a given that we as humans cannot possibly provide the kind of care that we wanna give our patients without a machine. I mean, you know, the average primary care provider that you might see, your family doctor, knows so little in terms of what's known, uh, but could know a lot given the right uh, support. Uh, and so there are all sorts of aspects of medical care that need decision support. Safety, medical error is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Cancer, heart disease, medical error. And um, you may know people uh, in your family or your friends who've had medical errors committed. It's a real problem. The, com the computers actually hasn't made that any better. In fact, it's even in some cases making it worse. Uh, so that we need really smart decision support. Diagnosis. Diagnosis is the third leading cause of medical error. It's either wrong, delayed, or it's, um, you know, what was the third one? Or missed completely. Uh, it's a, there are some diseases that take decades to be diagnosed. I'm gonna show you examples of this. Evidence-based clinical management. There are all these guidelines that we don't follow, not because we're bad people or we're not willing to put in the work. It's just the too many guidelines. If you want to find the guidelines for heart disease or kidney disease, you can spend three hours on Google or PubMed trying to find the right 
uh, information for your patient sitting in front of you. And lastly, which is actually one of my favorite topics, which we teach to the medical students at the end of their four years, cognitive challenges. First of all, there's complete overload. I don't know if any of you have seen the electronic health record. The font gets tinier. With the retina display screens, you can make it really tiny. There are just hundreds of pieces of information that the only response, honestly, is just to ignore parts of the screen because you just can't process it. And we have bias. And we're going to talk a lot about bias, that we have trouble uh, often making the right decisions because we have some bias going on in our head. And uh, theoretically, a computer can uh, bypass, we actually correct that or you know, sort of mitigate the effects of bias. So just briefly, what are the opportunities in the clinical encounter? Typical encounter, patient comes in, has a history and a physical, working diagnosis, there's some testing, there's some therapy, there's diagnostic reasoning, there's clinical decision analysis, test interpretation, that's got to be done computerized, can't expect us to do it. Uh, there are cognitive errors that will impact both those processes, and a machine can actually help us with all these different pathways. It can uh, provide accurate and timely diagnosis. It can provide sort of on the minute, you know, need to know basis uh, uh, for evidence-based therapy. Uh, and lastly, theoretically, a bias-free approach. Now, about 10 years ago, one of the medical students asked me, well, how do you know the algorithms aren't biased? And I thought, well, that's a really good question, but there was no evidence yet that the algorithms were biased. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of biased algorithms uh, at the end of this talk. But that said, these are the goals that we aspire to. So I want to make one distinction early on, which is, uh, again, one of the students uh, came up with this idea. Uh, that's why I like to teach. Uh, and if you have any ideas, share them with me. There's decision support where it implies that I can't make the decision without a machine. But then there's also just clinical support. Like I could, I could find the answer to that if I had three hours. I can see what the drug interactions are. If you give me a big enough table and you give me a computer with Excel, it's not that I can't do that. But there are circumstances where the human can't make the decision because they can't compute all the variables. A simple example, which I'll show you later on, is prediction. You know, I'm a kidney doctor, a patient comes in, I'm thinking, gee, are they going to need to have a kidney transplant in five years? Uh, I can, in the old days, we had a couple attributes, you know, their age and their diseases and medicines, et cetera. And now you can get a uh, algorithm that is trained on 200 different attributes, and it will give a much better prediction as to what's going to happen to that patient based on what the patient's history is. Um, we're going to revisit this uh, later on in the uh, talk. Uh, the clinical support, it's got an interface engine, it's got a set of rules, it's transparent. I know if I'm looking for drug-drug interactions, I have, there are the tables, there are the interactions, I know what the information is and how to access it. Clinical decision support, often the algorithms are opaque. Certainly, uh, if a machine trains on 300 different attributes, it's going to be hard for a person to understand uh, how the machine weighed the different attributes. So let's just briefly go over some classic examples. Clinical support, clinical decision support. Clinical support are prompts. You better do this. Uh, checklists. Did you think of all these things? Uh, drug dose modifications. I'm going to show you specific examples in a second. Drug interactions, medical history. That's something I can do. I can read 3,000 pages of a patient's chart, but I'd rather have a computer do it. Best evidence. We'll revisit this in a second. So prompts, the um, uh, HPV vaccine, which is hopefully going to eliminate cervical cancer on the planet Earth, uh, isn't given enough to young people or people of all ages, but it's really young people. And so uh, this uh, institution uh, created a prompt that basically patients, the, you know, the rules are if the patient's this age uh, and they haven't had the vaccine, that's easy to go to the vaccine table and it just prompts the provider to offer the vaccine and that has had great success. The numbers are even better now. So that's a simple one, prompts. Uh, missing lab values. 
you know, I'm a kidney doctor and there are certain lab values that I really must have in order to care for my patient. Well, what if I just forgot to order some of those tests? Even, you know, we, we forget things. That's why we need checklists. That's why we need help. So here, the machine reads all the lab values and it says, well, hold on a second. You didn't measure this. You didn't measure that. Uh, and we can't make a prediction because you didn't measure the things you needed. This could be in the electronic health record. This could be something that the doctor would actually see when they open the patient's record. We have to modify drug doses. If the patient's kidney function is poor, we can't give the full dose of a drug. We need it modified. Are we going to sit there with a slide rule and try to figure out, uh, or a calculator, we're going to try to figure out what the drug dose should be? No, we're going to want a machine to do that for us. Uh, drug interactions. This is a, a screenshot of our electronic health record. I try to order or have ordered warfarin and amiodarone or dabigantrin. These are both anticoagulants that uh, thin the blood. Uh, the machine warns me not to order those drugs. Now, we're going to see there's a real problem with the warning systems. But again, I could do this, but I'd much rather have the machine do it for me because I have other things to do. Uh, medical history. You know, in the old days, it used to be we'd admit a patient and there'd be one volume of their paper chart and there were 37 other volumes someplace off campus and, and we, we had no access to it. And you knew that the patient had important information. It was important information about the patient in those other volumes. We had no access to it. So you kind of did the best you could, which wasn't necessarily ideal. The opposite is true now. The electronic health record has all 37 volumes. We're talking about thousands and thousands of data points, of lab values going back for what, 20 years. Uh, maybe they had a pacemaker put in and there's a, there's a serial number buried in one of those charts. So that uh, causes the problem of too much information. Yes, I could say to you know, one of the medical students, read over every single note in the electronic health record, and then you figure out what's important. And uh, that would still be an onerous task. So we have uh, machines do that. This is uh, Noemi El Haddad, who's either lectured or is going to lecture. She invented this uh, fabulous um, uh, summarizer along with her team. Uh, uh, this is a timeline of admissions and it does a, it, it, the machine reads all the notes using natural language processing, and then it figures out what are the most important terms that the machine read. And so, actually, I love this because a first year medical student came up with the idea of word cloud. And she said, well, why don't we, because we're saying, how do you represent importance of a word? And she said, well, why don't we do word cloud? And you can see that lupus is the biggest word here it immediately tells you, if this patient walks in the emergency room, the emergency room doctors know immediately what the major problem is of this patient. Has a seizure disorder, that means she's got lupus in her brain, et cetera, et cetera. And the machine will also direct you to the actual note that this were, these words occurred. It was, it was brilliant. One downside is, I, I don't know if you ever heard the term cut and paste, but the way doctors and students write their notes now is they cut and paste. They cut out something from one note and they paste into the next note. So this was a challenge for Noemi and the team. How, how do you account for that? Like the machine might, if there was cutting and pasting of lupus 400 times, then the machine is going to think lupus was important. So there had to be a way to take that into account and uh, create, you know, sort of modify the algorithm so it didn't double count, so to speak. It's, um, it's, a, it's a real breakthrough. On the other side is what our current electronic health record looks like. As far as I'm concerned, it's nowhere as near as good as Noemi's algorithm, but it's not bad. It's got medications, it's got family comments, um, you know, health maintenance. Here, are, you know, uh, vaccines that they never got. Uh, here are other diseases that the patient had. My only point is that yes, we could come up with all that information, but it's it's just too much, and we should have a machine do it. Best evidence, this is an obvious one. Uh, you get PubMed guided to the patient, link to the patient's record. It gives you the up-to-date evidence uh, and you know it just saves a lot of searching. So that's clinical support, but let's go to the harder ones, the ones that actually uh, are problematic in that 
we humans can't accomplish the goals that a machine can. So I'd like to talk about diagnosis first. Uh, there are two diagnostic tools. Uh, one is active. I sit in front of a machine and I type in signs and symptoms. There are a couple out there. There's one I'm going to show you in a second that was spectacular, that is spectacular. Uh, and, and then I think one that will be becoming more important as the EHR develops is an automated diagnostic tool. That is, we're all at home, we're asleep, the patient, you know, I'm not looking at the record, the patient is at home. Uh, then the machine, which never sleeps, of course, is running through all the notes, looking for certain diseases. Say, wow, there's a 30% probability this patient has this disease. So these are automated systems. They're still rudimentary now. Um, one of the articles that I had sent to you was something that we did with multiple sclerosis. I'll show you that slide in a second. Uh, but the idea is that the machine, given the right set of probabilities and knowledge and training, may end up recognizing diseases that are underdiagnosed. I think Noemi might have talked about endometriosis. Uh, there's a disease that I think the average lag period between symptoms and diagnosis is 10 or 15 years. It's, it's shocking. Um, so a machine may be able to figure that out before the doctors do. So this is a diagnostic tool. It's called Isabel. It's, um, if you have nothing better to do, there's a free version for patients. Uh, it's pretty good. It's, um, we have it on the Columbia uh, Library site. You, you, you do a little bit of demographics, age, gender, pregnancy, travel history, Travel history. I mean, you know, it, it knows a lot, uh, Isabel. It uh, knows if you were living in Connecticut, you might have Lyme disease, or if you went to, um, you know, overseas, you might have dengue. Uh, and then you put in the uh, signs and symptoms, and then Isabel gives you a list of possibilities. Now, what I like about this is uh, it shows you things that you never thought about. It doesn't mean that the patient has it, but it at the very least, you'll learn something about that disease. Uh, and, it's, and you reserve the right to revisit it when the other diseases don't pan out. Uh, what I really like about this, and this is only the Columbia version, as long as we're raising the uh, banner for Columbia, is that our version, you can click a disease and it takes you to the best resources that money can buy. I mean, we spend millions of dollars on resources. They're all proprietary. And all except for PubMed, of course, Dynamed Plus. So you click on something and it gets you right to the chapter in a book on what that disease is all about and it helps you make the diagnosis. So diagnostic tools are out there. Uh, they're very effective. What's Every time I've had a conversation with people who are not in medicine, about like friends and family who sit around the table, et cetera. And I tell them about this and they, they say, well, all doctors use this, right? And shockingly, it's completely underused. There are a couple health centers around the country like Mayo Clinic, et cetera, that have this built into the electronic health record. But you know, even at Columbia, we can't get the providers to use this because either they're not aware of it um, or they just don't, you know, they don't know what to think about it. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and I don't know who's going to do that work. Now, I like the idea of automated diagnosis too. And one of the papers that um, we sent was on chronic kidney disease. Uh, there are patients who have chronic kidney disease. The machine knows that. It's a simple calculation. It's one blood test that virtually every single adult has had at least once in their life. And all you, the machine needs to know is your blood test for the whatever, you know, the kidney blood test, plus your age and your weight. And then it knows whether or not you have chronic kidney disease. So we did a study where we asked, well, the machine knows that patient had chronic kidney disease. Does the doctor know? So we read all the notes of the doctors using natural language processing. And we found that about 30% of the patients, there was no mention in their chart of chronic kidney disease that it just hadn't you know, broken through uh, the consciousness of the doctor. And as a result, the patients were not treated with the optimal medicine for people with chronic kidney disease who um, need uh, continued therapy. But these are all blood tests. These are easy. 
machine, you know, it's like Excel. It's what we call structured data. It's in a little box in an Excel table. But what about words? And I think this is a very interesting uh, area of research and uh, decision support. Oh, this is how you, I just wanted to finish that. The machine calculates the kidney function. And I just want to call your attention to the fact that in the, in the calculation of the kidney function, based on that one blood test, there's a race cor uh, correction. We're going to get back to that. Um, so that's how the machine calculates it. But how about words? In fact, when you think about it, most patients have signs and symptoms. And how does the machine know that you have those signs and symptoms? There's got to be a way for the computer to figure that out. So it might be a code. Someone's complaining of shortness of breath. I'm the doctor. Somehow I managed to put in the code for shortness of breath. The machine can find that. But for the most part, we don't do that because most of the codes, sadly, are for billing. So you bill for diseases, but you don't necessarily bill for signs and symptoms unless they all aggregate to some disease. So imagine the patient comes in and it's complaining of lead weakness, leg weakness and double vision and migraine headaches uh, and a couple other things, whatever, you know, uh, numbness. Uh, that could be trained on and a multiple sclerosis diagnostic assistant could be uh, developed that it trains on people with multiple sclerosis, it finds the signs and symptoms, and then it builds a classifier, which basically helps uh, in the prediction as to whether or not the patient has the disease. And so that little machine can go through patient's notes. In fact, there was a group out in the California that was gonna use our algorithm uh, in Kaiser, which is a gigantic health center, to see if they could find patients with multiple sclerosis. Um, so, uh, again, this is something that's in the future. Um, it has a great potential. It's got to be brick by brick. You know, there's, there's one thing I learned in, uh, in informatics and um, decision support is there's no one tool fits all. Every tool has to be built separately, possibly uniquely uh, by some person who really has a bee in their bonnet and wants to, wants to uh, create something important. But here's the real reason why we need those diagnostic tools. And the, um, the problem is that nobody in your healthcare system actually knows your whole story. It's like three blind men and the elephant. Then you go to your primary care provider and you say you have headaches. And then you go to your OBGYN and you say, I had some bladder leakage. And you then go to your ophthalmologist because you had double vision. And you go to your physical therapist because they have leg weakness. Taken together, that makes a pretty good case for multiple sclerosis. But each provider doesn't know what the whole record is. Now you could argue, well, why didn't they read the notes of all the other doctors? It's just not possible. You know, you know, there's not enough time uh, and sometimes Sometimes, you know, it's just hard to access it. But a machine can put all that together. Uh, and I keep thinking of writing a letter to the Times about, you know, meet your new primary care provider, the electronic health record. It's the only place that knows everything about you. Now, you'll think, well, what if you go to your ophthalmologist is in Mount Sinai and your OBGYN is at NYU and your uh, you know, your primary providers at uh, NYP. Obviously, that's a problem. The, the feds, fortunately, are forcing interoperability. They're forcing communication between medical centers. Nobody wanted to do it for political and monetary reasons. Too bad. And that's going to change the game here. So I have very high hopes for this. So these are diagnostic tools. Uh, just briefly, just a couple more examples. Uh, there's now a way to scan people's retinas using a uh, algorithm uh, that was trained on hundreds of thousands of patients with diabetic retinopathy. That's where the blood vessels from people with diabetes get damaged. And in the old days, if I was a primary provider and a patient had diabetes, I'd send them to an ophthalmologist because I'm not an expert in di uh, diabetic uh, ophthalmology, ophthalmology. And now there's a scanner, it's being rolled out in many institutions 
probably cost a fortune, but it's incredibly good. I mean, 99% sensitivity and almost you know 99% specificity, but that's okay. If you have a couple of false positives, big deal. That's why you can send the patient to an ophthalmologist, uh, you know, refer them to. So there's tremendous success in areas that involve imaging, you know, radiological diagnosis of uh, cancer, um, pathology diagnosis of, uh, you know, on biopsies. Now that's probably where we've had the greatest um, uh, success is in imaging. Um, let's just briefly go through more evidence-based management. As I mentioned, uh, there are predictors. There are, now, there are 40 different chronic kidney disease predictors, uh, which all of which are more or less the same. We even built one. It's not that much different than anybody else's. Uh, but uh, it's helpful for me to sit in front of a machine and have the computer say, this patient has very slim chance of needing dialysis in five years it will make me less aggressive and I'll make sure not to hurt them with the medicines. Visualization, it's an obvious one. This is kind of old, I kept meaning to change this one, but basically it shows you what the blood tests are over a week. It's, you know, you get a snapshot, you know exactly what's happening. Um, let's just move on. Now let's talk about decision analysis. We actually uh, teach this uh, in medical school. Decision analysis basically uh, is a way to weigh the pros and cons and then help the patient understand what the outcome means to them. So just take something simple like drug one and drug two. I mean, patient comes to me and has high blood pressure. Should I give them this drug or that drug? There can't be anything simpler than that. Well, for each drug, there's efficacy. Not every drug works equally well you know, in patients. Maybe this drug has, is effective in 80% of patients. My point here is there's a probability associated with that. And it could also maybe be not effective, um, which is not, un, you know, uh, it, it happens more often than we'd like to think. Each branch is associated with an adverse drug event, at least one major one or not. And so you can see how complicated this tree becomes because, in fact, there are eight different possible outcomes. You know, you can be on drug true have an effective uh, response, but then suffer an adverse drug event. Or you can be on drug two, you took it, it's not effective, but thank God you didn't get an adverse drug event. So how does, to, every time I show the slide, I think of how did we make decisions, you know, before, you know, we even started thinking about this. You just kind of went with your gut, which, you, you know, your gut is probably more wrong than right uh, most of the time. Uh, you really need to flesh out all the different possibilities. But a human can't do that. And that's where we are, that especially as we enter the field, as we get to um, precision medicine, uh, the influence of genetics, uh, we might know in advance that the patient can't metabolize drug two, so we're going to stay away from drug two. This has all got to be done computationally. And just as an added bonus, um, I just mentioned uh, drug-drug interactions. What if you're giving this drug to a person who's on six other drugs? And this is my mother-in-law who's no longer with us, but she gave me HIPAA permission to tell her story. That's her bag of medicines. She used to come to our house, that's my kitchen table, and she'd say, you know, Herbie, do I need all these medicines? And I, of course, immediately panicked and thought, well, God, you know, they have to be interacting with each other. It ended up she more or less did need most of those medicines, but you can imagine the combinations and permutations that one or two or more of those medicines is going to interfere or in, um, interact with one of those medicines. Comorbidities, people have different diseases. All of this goes into uh, the decision between drug one and drug two, including pharmacogenomics. Some people have a genetic predisposition to um, under-metabolism. Um, mentioned genetic recommendations. We've made a tremendous amount of progress uh, that's got to be factored in the electronic health record. Uh, and there's a lot of work there. How do you, how do you weave that into uh, a decision for the physician? So this is the, a brief summary of where we are. We've made a tremendous amount of progress. Um, and, you know, the future is very bright. 
uh, especially as our genetic understanding of the genetic basis of the human condition expand. Let me sort of wind up this talk and talk and, and discuss what I consider serious issues. We're going to talk about inaccuracy, unintended consequences. We're going to talk about biased algorithms and my favorite topic, fraud and bribery. And I, I mean, I say that facetiously. I've been studying pharma for years. There's a huge amount of fraud and bribery in uh, pharma. You're, I'm sure you've seen the, the Alzheimer's drugs has just been um, okayed by the FDA. There's no compelling evidence that they work and they cost a fortune. So just in terms of inaccuracy, I always thought this was funny. Um, I got an email from LinkedIn and the subject says, I got the email, do you know Herbert Chase? And I thought, is, am I having some existential crisis now that I, they're saying, do you really know Herbert Chase? Chanwa, I think has either given you a lecture or will give you a lecture. But that's, in, that, that's a, you know, a, a high school error. Uh, I mean, whoever programmed that, you know, that's a, a line of code that could have been changed, no big deal. But who cares if LinkedIn makes a mistake? But we care deeply. And in fact, we'll never, ever use an algorithm that makes a mistake, period. You can't, you don't get second chances. I think that's why the startup field is having such problem breaking into healthcare, even though they've got some clever devices, is because they can't prove that, it's, that it doesn't make a mistake. Or if it makes a mistake like a false positive, it has to have no consequence. So here's a simple example of a clinical decision support tool to help people with diabetes. Uh, patient has diabetes and it's out of control. That's what this means here. And the machine has a decision support tool. And the first thing it has to know is who's got diabetes. You know, you can, I mean, what if we're actually getting dinged by the feds, Medicare, if we don't manage certain conditions well. Um, I don't think we're getting rewarded for managing conditions well, but that's another story. But the, so the machine has to figure out who has diabetes. Well, the simplest way to do that is the billing code. Patient had diabetes, we, we submitted a bill and those are the codes up there. So the machine goes to the codes and then it figures out who has diabetes. It also looks at, you know, the, the database is pretty simple. It's a bunch of Excel spreadsheets down in the basement someplace. It looks to see what the patient's blood values are for this. And then it says, well, hold on a second. Uh, the diabetes control is not optimal. The patient has diabetes and the blood value is wrong. So what if the machine makes a mistake? It thinks that the patient has diabetes because somebody put the code in when the patient doesn't have diabetes. So that, at the very least, is going to annoy the provider. I mean, there are a lot of examples of this, where just recently somebody said they got a warning to stop doing something that they had stopped doing about two weeks ago. So the reverse is also equally problematic. What if the patient has diabetes and the machine misses it? Those codes are notoriously inaccurate. That's been proved over and over again. Now, we have a new field called phenotyping. I think, um, did Noemi talk about being, or some, George, which is basically put a collection of attributes to identify people with diabetes. Okay, so they've got the code, maybe their sugar's high, maybe they're on insulin, all the things that we'd associate with the care of diabetes, and that is making uh, the identification of patients far more accurate. It's still not bulletproof. You know, they're gonna be sensitivity and specificity issues. So false negatives are problems. If you miss the people with diabetes, false positives are problems. You know, if you start sending messages to patients who don't have diabetes, um, and uh, that has got better, but it's still a problem. I think George probably mentioned phenotyping in the context of decision support. We want to identify the right patients. Un unintended consequences. This is, uh, Chuck Friedman is one of the giants in the field. He's got a long list of corollaries and theorems, which I won't bore you with, but he's got a really interesting concept here, which is a person uh, working in partnership with an information resource that is better than 
that person unassisted. So we get back to the original definition. We have more, it's a partnership, machine, me and the machine. It's gonna help me be better. But what's fascinating is whether or not that's true depends on me interacting with the resource. Now you all have apps. I'm sure you've discovered that some apps are so smooth that there's no effort whatsoever in figuring out how to use them. That was Steve Jobs' genius, absolute genius. Then there are other apps that after the 14th time, you can't get to the screen that you wanted the screen, you couldn't order the thing, or the cab didn't show up or whatever, you just stop using it. So we may develop a resource. And one of the problems in our field is that we have a lot of really smart people, this is true of, um, of uh, the startups, who are developing useful apps that really are hard to use. And they don't necessarily, they're not at all intuitive. Uh, they haven't been you know, integrated into workflow. And basically, they'll end up you know, dying and not being used. And the other important point here, you can't predict in advance. I'm going to make a big deal out of our failure to test adequately. You really need to test on a group of people who are computer illiterates. I don't think my wife would be offended if I called her a, a, a low-tech person. Um, she can't stand tech. If she can use it, then it's worth trying to implement. And that's what we don't do. So we're going to talk more about that in a second. Um, and just to reiterate, informatics is more about people than it is technology. In fact, to some extent, the algorithms are pretty low level now. We're not doing anything, you know, we're not trying to do, you know, quantum computing or figuring out whether or not the moonshot is going to. This is pretty straightforward, you know, prompts, um, you know, uh, predictive models. It's really about workflow. Where does this fit in? I mean, I mean, you've probably had the experience of renting a car. And you get in the car and you realize it looks nothing like the car that you're used to driving. And so if you, you don't generally just start driving, well, maybe you do. I mean, I used to do that. You don't should just drive because there are all these things are in different places. You know, where are the lights? I got to test the whole. That's the problem that we're confronted with, um, with decision support tools in a, in a machine, is that it, there's a certain workflow that we're used to. And to introduce something new, can have serious consequences. Um, this is the five rights. We're going to talk about this in a second. Ideally, the decision support tool provides the right information. That's hard, easier said than done. To the right person. In the right format. Could be a graph. Could be a prompt. It could be uh, text. Uh, it could be you know, a bell going off someplace. Through the right channel. We developed, one of the medical students a couple of years ago developed a texting prompt where if an abnormal lab value came back, it would automatically be texted to the provider. That was the best channel uh, for that uh, decision support tool. At the right time, don't flash the prompt, you know, until I open the chart to see the patient, you know, or make sure when I open it the next time, that's where the prompt is shown. So let me talk briefly about unintended consequences. This was a study um, at UPenn. They decided to implement a, uh, for, uh, a clinical decision support tool where you could have physician order entry. Now it's mandated by the state. If I order a medicine for you, I have to do it through a computer, which is a good idea. So they decided that they would implement this, which was, again, a great idea, but they, for reasons that are inexplicable, they tested it out. They implemented it in the pediatric intensive care unit. So the workflow went from the helicopter lands on top of the building, the child's in the helicopter, the nurse is with the child, with the parents, and the nurse calls the ICU and says, draw me up four different drugs. I'm you know, making this up. And as soon as the child got off the helicopter, they'd immediately go to the ICU and get the medicines immediately. When they implemented the decision support tool, before any of that could happen, the parents had to sit down and give all the information to the person who's typing it into a machine so that the machine would then be able to take the doctor's order. It delayed 
the medications by about an hour or two. And as a result, shockingly, 52 children died as a result of that implementation. Um, things are better since then. The study is a little bit old, but the idea that it was not tested, again, that gets back to Chuck Friedman's point about you just can't predict in advance and you got to worry about workflow. This was a classic interference with workflow. Alert fatigue. This is plaguing us that we, you know, it's all great if I tell you about the 47 different decision support tools that we have that alert me to do this or that. Uh, then I get alert fatigue. It's a great term because it means that I'm sick of getting these alerts. So David Bates was up at Harvard. He's a brilliant scientist and clinician. He asked the question, what's the cost, both in health and money, of doctors ignoring the drug-drug interaction prompts? And it always occurred to me that if you get an interaction prompt, you may be irritated, you want to click it out, you may be angry at the EHR, whatever, but you can't, you shouldn't ignore it because it may be important. Now, granted, there are a lot of studies showing that a lot of those aren't important, and that's the problem. And what they studied, a huge database, uh, and looked for drug-drug interactions, and these were a little bit of guesstimation. He was very upfront about that. But it, but it, their, you know, back of the envelope numbers seem to show that 200,000 um, unintended uh, consequences of uh, excuse me, drug drug interactions costing between um, a billion dollars, around a billion dollars. And I think that these patients had adverse events, 200,000 adverse drug events. You know, some of them, and again, as I, as I pointed out, if you're taking seven drugs, uh, those alerts may be really important. So, alert fatigue, you know, a lot of the solutions that we think of, people then say, well, is that going to overwhelm the clinician? It's a real problem. There's no good answer now. They've had dozens of papers trying to get rid of all the you know drug drug alerts that seem irrelevant with no hope. Um, here's a good one. I'm not. Talking, I'm sorry. I don't mean a good one. An interesting one. Over reliance. Over reliance. I'll just briefly. Sidebar, I've got two cars, one from 2007 and one from 2017. 2017 car, it's got all the bells and whistles. When I'm backing up, if I'm about to back up into a tree, the machine, the car makes a really bad noise and if necessary, stops. I get in my other car and I kind of forget where I am. So I'm backing up and backing up. I come that close to smashing into the tree. And one of the lecturers here, I think, is Ginny going to, um, Lorenzi going to talk in the course? Ginny Lorenzi? She told me that her, her father died and her brother and she went to the funeral. And her brother, who had all the bells and whistles in his car, drove her car because he had to go someplace and he backed into a tree because he didn't have the warning. So we're, the, the fear here is that we, we are over-reliant. If I'm relying on the prompt for a flu vaccine and and the rule broke. That's what this study is about. The rule, you've all probably done programming. You know how easy it is to have, drop a line of code. If the rule breaks and I'm expecting and I'm not going to give my patient the flu vaccine because it will never pop up. And I won't think about whether or not they need their flu vaccine. So over-reliance is a real problem. And who's monitoring all the, the um, uh, decision support tools? That's very costly, and the hospitals need to do that. Um, so here are some, you know, I've gone through these already. Vaccination reminders, uh, the unintended consequence. Uh, you have get multiple. There was a study where some patient got 17 flu vaccines because the prompt in one year, because the prompt kept getting off. Drug-drug interactions, we've talked about diagnostic tools. That Isabel diagnostic tool was great, but am I going to test for every single one of those things on that list? Over-testing is a real problem. Uh, summarization, knowing me followed up by basically, you go into the emergency room, you see the summary. It's fantastic for those physicians who have to make a split decision. But at the end of the day, they have no recollection of what was wrong with that patient the next day. So it's not good for chronic care. You need to kind of drag yourself through all the stories in order to understand the patient's full history. And guidelines. 
Guidelines are good for the generic patient. They're not, you know, the guideline for a 92-year-old man is going to be different than for a 62-year-old man. Uh, so if I just simply follow the guidelines, that, you know, that is, might be problematic. Uh, there's a concept in uh, ethics called equipoise, which basically means when you intervene or subject a patient to some new thing, drug, you can't know in advance whether it's going to help or hurt. Because if you did, you have no ethical basis of intervening. If you know that it's going to make people better, you should don't test it. Give it to everybody because you want to make them better. If you know it's going to harm the patient. So the only way the FDA or the, in, you know, the um, institutional review, review boards, the only ethical justification for doing an intervention is that you really don't know and you're going to have to do a randomized control trial. Plenty of drugs have helped patients through these trials, you know, past muster in a trial, and God bless pharma for making, and plenty of drugs never made it because they ended up harming more people. We don't do this in our field. We do not do this. We have a bunch of people like myself. We sit around and go, why don't we do this? Let's implement that uh, drug uh, in, uh, ordering tool in the ICU. What a great idea. It's going to really make sure that the, you know, the prescriptions can be read. It's not on paper. It will happen. And there are all sorts of great reasons, but we don't think enough about the unintended consequences, and we don't test it. I've already said we need to test with real users and not people like us. Cognoscenti, as I call them, the information that we, you know, we're we're geeky kind of people, and so even something that doesn't work well, we'll think is successful. And it's very disturbing to me that we roll things out uh, without an IRB protocol that absolutely, because there's some that we don't need an IRB protocol to to um, implement a decision support tool because it's going to improve safety. How do we know it's improved safety? Maybe it's going to worsen safety. Um, my last serious concerns are black box bias and fraud and bribery. Black box. So you've probably heard this term, artificial intelligence system whose inputs and operations are not visible to the user. So there are algorithms that train on, you know, 40,000 MRIs in the brain. And there's no, you know, who knows what the machine thinks is is useful. It's a little pixel here, or it's a little thing here. Uh, it's it it can't be explained to any of us. Um, and physicians are very much loath to do anything that they don't understand. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't uh, that they should not use it. But that's a real stumbling block for acceptance. Um, as I've already mentioned, there's serious mistrust. We've had a lot of, uh, there are a fair number of algorithms that are hard to get past the front door because the physicians don't understand it. So I thought a lot about this uh, and the black box. And then I thought, does it matter if we can't explain how the machine came up with its idea? Does it actually matter? And that got me thinking about the history of medicine. For thousands of years, we've done things that we can't explain. Dried skin of toads in China 2,000 years ago. The dried, I had no idea of how somebody came up with this idea. That cured heart failure. It wasn't until the 80s that we understood why. And it's because in the skin of toads is digitalis, which you've probably heard of. It's, treat, it's a treatment for heart failure. That's how the toad kills its predators, by exuding this digitalis-like thing, and the predator's heart rate goes to zero, and that's that. So throughout all of medicine, we've done countless things that we don't understand, that we can't explain, or the explanation we have was completely wrong. I mean, I, you know, I've been in the business for a while, and I look back at the things that we used to think, and I'm appalled. But what we can do is determine whether the intervention's effective. That's the key. Is it effective? And so, obviously, my this thought was not an original one. There's an article. Does it really matter if we can explain it? But it does matter if it's accurate. And so I want to share with you some of the 
issues about accuracy. So we've got proprietary algorithms. Um, Epic, which is our electronic health record, has an alert for sepsis, which is systemic infection, high fevers, and possible death. And it alerts and a bell might go off. And so one day I you know, teach the fourth year medical students and I, they told me about it. And I said, well, what do you do when the alert? And they said, we just ignore the alert. And I said, well, how can you ignore a sepsis alert? And she said, well, because nobody believes that it's valuable. So that got me thinking, well, what's the performance? Forget about how the alert, the algorithm was developed. I don't really care about the black box. I just want to know how predictive it is. What's the sensitivity and specificity? And Epic doesn't release it those because it's proprietary. And so I thought, well, why don't we do the study here at Columbia? I know the people in safety. Um, why don't we just, that's easy. If someone goes to the intensive care unit, you know, we'll see what the alert said and we'll figure out the sensitivity and specificity on our own. And before we even got the study done, it ended up that, um, where is it, Michigan, had done the study already. It came out like the week that we were thinking of doing it, not that that matters. And they showed that the sensitivity of the alert, that's how many people with sepsis were identified correctly, was wrong two thirds of the time. Only one third of the patients were identified and the false positive rate was 17%. All these people went to the unit when they didn't know to go to the unit. Sadly, the alert is still firing at NYP. I keep meaning to talk to the uh, NYP higher ups to see if they can get that eliminated. So just getting back, the black box does not upset me because we've lived the, uh, you know 2000 years of black box, probably even more, but how it performs is the key. And that's, if you read uh, the students of this um, on our elective uh, do journal club and they pick all these articles in the clinical domain uh, that are based on, you know, that show AI predictive of this particular, and the, the way the accuracy is reported it's all you know receiver operating characteristic area of the curve those are meaningless terms to physicians we just simply want to know what's the sensitivity and what's the specificity like any test that we use in medicine that's a real problem um race i've already mentioned i'm going to show you that slide again uh there's no question that inexplicably race has been used in various algorithms over the years. And without exception, every single one where race was used underestimated the illness of a patient of color. It wasn't, you could almost imagine that it would be 50 50, just randomly. You have 30 algorithms, people who have light skin, people have dark skin, uh, just as a statistical matter, you know, half the time one group would have a overestimated, the other group would have it, et cetera, et cetera. Every single one went in the uh, wrong direction, so to speak. And this was an article published in the England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. It was a real eye-opener. And I'm, I, I am really delighted, uh, if that's the right word, that Columbia has really taken a lead in trying to um, sort of remedy this situation. In fact, uh, Noemi uh, co-teaches um, uh, a course on ethics and AI. So let's get back to race. And here's my chronic renal disease calculator. Why was race in there? The thing that that article in the Journal of Medicine pointed out, which is disturbing, was that most of the time, the people who published those articles where race was part of the calculation couldn't explain why it was included. They literally couldn't explain it. And uh, actually, George Rupsack and his team are working on ways to come up with a measurement of Func uh, you know, a filtration function of the kidney function without using race. And they're finding that basically uh, their algorithm is far more accurate, doesn't include race, and it doesn't punish uh, the patients of color who really have been, it overestimates how good their kidney is. So you say, well, you don't need dialysis because your kidney function is good. When in fact, by including the race correction, that was wrong. This one came out very recently in the COVID era. And you know the pulse oximeters that you wear on your finger? Whether or not you get admitted to the hospital for COVID depended upon what that value was. 
So if your oxygen is below a certain level, you go directly to intensive care unit. Because the measurement looks at your red blood cells, amongst other things, it is based, I think, it, it color plays a role. And it ends up that patients of color had inappropriately overestimates of their actual oxygen levels, which means a patient coming in who really had an oxygen level that was worthy of an intensive care bed didn't get it because the pulse oximeter thought their oxygen level was higher than it actually was. I haven't been able to uh, find the citation for this, but I was told, I'm sounding like our politicians, I was told that the company who did who developed this actually was aware of this, that they had trained on an unrepresentative set of patients uh, and they sort of had to be forced uh, to acknowledge that. And that's the, I mean, that's disturbing to think that it was known beforehand. So I, all I can, you know, you, you really uh, focus on the individual lives of these people. There are all these people who didn't get admitted because and when they should have. Um, so this just gets back to, you need to train on the right set, um, faulty assumptions. Uh, let me just skip through this because um, we're getting late. Now, lastly, um, uh, pharma, you know, I think set the example for fraud and bribery. Not to say they've made incredible drugs. I mean, they, God, they've just completely altered the practice of medicine, pharma. So I have deep, deep respect and there's some really, really great companies out there. But there's a lot of uh, manipulating the data. I won't take you through uh, you know, it's a it's subject of a different talk, but because of my years of being paranoid about pharma, I got paranoid about AI, and I, and then my worst fears were realized. I'll show you. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who you know worried about it. But you know, they call patients were dying. It's a it's a statin. It's basically just like the lipid lowering drugs. It's one of many, and this one ended up killing people. And it was took months before it got removed from the market. So here's a bribery example. That is practice fusion. It's an EHR that you can, I have EHR on my home computer. I can order drugs, you know, medicines for, you know, my family um, uh, or myself. Uh, and I always, it, it, it looks so nice. You know, the interface is so much nicer than the hospital EHR. And practice fusion got bought by all scripts which then paid uh, the vendor or paid the companies to steer the doctors without their knowing it. See, that's, the, that's what's really um, terrifying about this. Steer the doctors towards, oh, um, excuse me, prescribing of all things opiates. So what that meant is you'd have a patient that you're putting in and it would say you have pain, you have headache, blah, blah, blah. And instead of, you know, it would give you a list of drugs that you might order. The machine actually was offering opiates when it probably should have been offering, you know, far less uh, um, dangerous drugs, especially with the opiate um, uh, problem that we're having actually all over the world. So they got, dinged 145 million, which I thought was laughably too low. Um, and I'm deeply concerned because there's no end to where this can, how, how this might unfold. You can imagine, you know, the diagnostic assistant we built could have multiple sclerosis, fine patients, and then maybe the recommendation is to take a drug. You know, how many people use WebMD? All those drug ads along the sides. In fact, when I, I worked with the Watson team like a decade ago, and they were building a diagnostic tool, which was actually pretty incredible. Uh, and I said, well, what's your source of information? They said WebMD, which of course is proprietary, you know, they get advertising money. So my only point here is that not only do I need to worry about how well an algorithm performs, but I really have to know what its steps are. What's it leading me to? Is it going to ask me, is it going to give me a list of drugs that I should use? 
um, very, very important. And that's where we need oversight by the hospital. So I just want to make a final point about sort of the professionalism. In medical school, we spend a lot of time talking about the ethics of our profession. Do no harm, beneficence, justice. Everybody should be able to be treated. We self-monitor. We have four years of discussions of the ethical um, behavior of a physician. Corporate development doesn't necessarily have that. As I said, there's some great companies out there. I think Pfizer is one. I think Merck is one. Uh, but there isn't the same culture. And at the end of the day, who are the beneficiaries of startup health interventions? Patients, hopefully, but they have, they have investors. They have venture capital. They've got stock performance that it can't help but cause a conflict. So the problem, of course, is that decision support tools may be developed faster on the corporate side because they're not bogged down by all the problems of not getting funded and you know going through this IRB, et cetera. Uh, it's much slower on this side. But then what they develop has to be scrutinized. And we're still, the idea that that sepsis prompt is still running on NYP, I think is emblematic of the fact that we really don't have good oversight yet. So conclusions, optimal care cannot be achieved without clinical system support, augmented intelligence. It must be designed to enhance, not hinder medical practice. You can't figure that out unless you test it. You have to reduce, not increase cognitive load. And the performance must be reported before being deployed. Otherwise, you have no right. Just the way you wouldn't give a drug. The FDA would never let you give a drug if you didn't know how well it performed. And the users must follow recommendations, but only after evidence of utility and safety. So I think hopefully we've uh, accomplished our objectives, uh, defining decision support, why we need it, examples, and concerns. Thank you. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, I will say that when I started giving the lectures on AI, you know, 10 years ago, I was all 100% gung-ho. And with good reason, because I've suffered through all the things that we didn't know. I mean, just in the 70s, uh, when computers started being used by industry all over the world, we said, wow, this is incredible. It's going to so improve medical practice. And then 40 years elapsed and basically nothing happened. So totally gung-ho. And then slowly became aware of all the challenges with unintended consequences, poor oversight, cost, um, uh, alert fatigue. If I don't know, did you read about the nurse who was, she, I don't know if she, she went to jail, but she was prosecuted for having given the wrong, it's tragic, obviously, she's like devastated. And I think what I learned is that she kept over, the nurses keep overriding all the warnings because they can't get into the medicine cabinet. That's all workflow. So I've moved more of my talk now is on what I'm worried about uh, than it used to be in the past. Yes, ma'am. Everybody who took money from the feds for a hospital uh, electronic health record has to have some decision support tool. It's called meaningful use. I don't know if uh, David or somebody talked about it, but when Obama's administration, he they, they spent billions of dollars paying doctors and hospitals to put in an electronic health record. So yeah, but it can't, it couldn't just be, you know, what are the patient's names and addresses? It had to have some useful tool. And drug-drug interactions is probably the first major tool that was put in there. It had the, you know, the electronic ordering 
And that has helped a lot. Um, so I would say nationally, most of them have something. Epic uh, has a lot of decision support tools. Some are worthless. Epic is the name of the company. I love the idea that you named your company Epic. You know, I mean, hubris. Uh, so they've got a lot of tools. But that's, of course, the flip side, which is how many tools do you need? Is that going to interfere with your uh, uh, you know, cognition? The nurse also said that she kept getting interrupted. And that has me worried for the medical people that there are times in life when you, I'm sure you've had this, when you want to make a decision, you really have to kind of block everything and have a time for deep thinking. That's one of the problems with devices, I think. I mean, I'm guilty too. I'm constantly checking the mail or when politics or whatever, something's stupid. Uh, and if you keep getting interrupted, you're not going to be able to really think about all the, the chain of events that's going to occur downstream. So some of the tools are great. Some of the tools are worthless. Some of the tools are redundant. Um, but, you know, hopefully we'll make progress uh, and uh, things will get better. And I'm hoping maybe some of you people will be the ones who do that. I understand it's really tough because that you know they get better, but performance shouldn't be a problem to the least, right? <laughs> it's a really great question. I consulted on and off with startups, and I hope they have a great idea. I go, well, how does it perform? They have no data. So sometimes they don't even they haven't really measured the performance in a way that you and I would measure them, where you have, you know, strict rules about, uh, you know, who's going to, where the intervention is going to occur, what's the cohort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think uh, the Apple Watch, one of the apps here, is to determine whether or not you have an arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. So now you would think that the sensitivity would be very high. If you got it, your watch is going to figure it out. And that would be okay to have a false positive. You call your doctor, you say, look at the tracing, and they go, that's not atrial fibrillation, don't worry about it. Apple never released what the performance was. And recently, I think one of the students told me, again, I can't, I don't know if this is published, probably not, uh, that the sensitivity is actually pretty low. It's not 100%, it's not 80%, it's not 60%. It's missing, it's touted as telling you whether or not you have atrial fibrillation, but it has really got a very low sensitivity. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, there's no performance, uh, because I think maybe it's also, if you release the performance, then your stock is going to plunge just the way the FD says your drug doesn't work. Um, common diseases versus rare diseases. Yeah, and that's a really good point because I think that for the common diseases, you don't need a diagnostic tool. You might need guidelines. Uh, for the rare diseases, uh, that's where I think a decision support tool would be handy. I'm, I'm guessing that genetics is going to play a major role in the rare diseases. Uh, you know, we're looking, there was some report that pancreatic cancer, which is one of the very serious cancers that's very hard to diagnose. There might be a blood test that looks at some genetic uh, footprint. But for the rare diseases, we're going to need tools. Thank you. Keep in touch if you have anything to. Sorry, I created such a May. <laughs> I'm getting lost. Oh, no. 